All right, well, good morning. If you, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Mark, and I'm the executive pastor here at the Grove. I speak about once a month, and when I'm studying the Bible, I really am able to connect those truths with stories. I just kind of live in stories and illustrations. They just help me really wrap my mind around things, and so a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll tell a lot of stories, and recently there's been some question that has come back to me a few different times where people have said, hey, are those stories really true? And um, I'll just go ahead and tell you, as far as my memory serves me, I've told every story I've told has been 100% true. Now, my memory has some issues, but as far as my memory serves me, they're 100% true. Now, I thought most of those were just kind of the normal human experience, like everybody was like, ah, oh, yeah. And I found out lately that evidently there, there's some things about my, my life that are kind of unique. I, uh, some strange things have happened. But for the most part, I feel like, man, there are kind of some things that we can agree on. But just to prove that, that the stories are actually true, you know, there's a story that I told a few times back about when I was in college and, uh, and playing football and we were in this big game and it's like this one thing that I wish I could take back. Does anybody remember this? There was a uh, this play where the quarterback, he threw, he threw a pass out to the sideline, and I stepped up and, and got that interception, all right? So I didn't get many, so I got one that day. And it was out in that part of the field where there was only green grass between me and the, and the goal line. And there was only one guy, and he wasn't really in between me and the goal line. He was way over here, the quarterback. And instead of just taking the sideline, scoring the touchdown, I, uh, I turned and made a beeline for the quarterback and re- tried to run him over and just keep going, which was a really, really bad decision. I ended up tripping and falling, and, uh, and we didn't score that day. And uh, the time that I talked about it before, it was a Sunday that we were talking about second chances, and it's crazy because I got to play in an alumni game years later, and the exact same play happened. I was out there, caught the ball, sideline, this is my chance to redeem myself, and I made the turn and ran over the quarterback again. And I know that sounds like that couldn't be true, but we had a family friend that sent a newspaper article to us this week, and I didn't, I had forgotten that this article even existed, but it's about that game, all right, and uh, through it, the coach is, is pretty positive about what happened. I had forgotten that we lost that game seven to nothing, and so that play would have tied the game, but then the coach is positive, but look what the writer says at the end of the article. This is hilarious. He says, A less positive coach might have found fault with Pal Freeman's play last Saturday night. Only one player, quarterback J.J. Eckerd, stood between Pal Freeman and a possible touchdown after his interception against the Redmen. Pal Freeman made no attempt to dodge or elude the smaller Eckerd. He simply tried to plow over the Northeastern player and stumbled to the turf after a 16-yard return. My coach said, I think it was the aggressiveness in him. And at the end, it says, Pal Freeman admitted as much. <laughs> so see, I'm telling you, it is totally, the, the parts I forget are just that we, I would have won the game if I'd actually done it. But, you know, I've gone back to that, and I think if, if you put me in that spot a hundred times, a hundred times out of a hundred, I probably would have made the choice to go truck the dude. Now, Why? Well, from the time I was little and I played this game, I naturally gravitated towards defense. And every week, every practice, every training, what were you taught to do? You don't run from anybody. You run at them, right? That's the whole goal of playing defense. You're tackling guys. And so I get the ball, and my natural tendency is not to run away from somebody. It's to run at them. So I went to my natural tendency, and I think I would do the same thing 100 times. We start talking about this, uh, this area of communication and relationships. There's a natural tendency that we have, a uh, natural gravitational pull that we have. And that's to, to hide the things that we don't really want to talk about, to make assumptions about the, what the other person is thinking or feeling, and not to really have the conversation, to talk a whole lot but not really ever say anything. Those are the things that we naturally do instead of sitting down and talking about hard topics, sharing our hearts. We don't want to go there. It's almost like that area is, is just forbidden, you know. It's often an area that we just, we just don't want to go there because it, it might get awkward if we go beneath the surface. In fact, today the focus is going to be on these, these topics that are forbidden, that we just don't talk about these things. 
I looked it up this last week. If you go to a dinner party, Google would tell you that if you go to a dinner party, don't talk about sex, religion, or politics. Those three things are going to get you in trouble. And so we just know, hey, those those are things that are over there and they're forbidden. So we're not going to venture into that area. That's really risky. It makes me think, growing up, we... uh, we would change our own oil. You know, we kind of lived outside of town, and Dad had made this really cool thing that we could pull the car up on, and we'd just change the oil. And I knew that you changed the oil every 3,000 miles. And we had a friend, guy I knew, who let it go beyond 3,000 miles. And I give it, he probably let it go like 20,000 miles, but the car blew up. And in my mind, if you let your car go over 3,000 miles, it was going to blow up. It's just what was going to happen. So I was religious. We're going to change it 3,000 miles. We're going to change it 3,000 miles. And then, if y'all noticed, like, that started to stretch some. As, as oil, I guess, viscosity right, has gotten better, you know, you can go 6,000 miles. But that feels really funny to me. I got a Volkswagen recently, and I went to have the oil change, and the guy said, hey, you don't have to bring it back for 10,000 miles. I saw a, new, a commercial yesterday where they said there was some oil that you don't have to change but once a year. So I'm trying to go 10,000 miles, but right now I'm at about six, and there's this thing inside of me that, like, man, I'm in uncharted territory, and I'm pretty sure my car's going to blow up, you know? Now, it's this beautiful thing that I don't have to change my oil that much, and this is an awesome freedom that we have that I don't have to keep on going back and keep on going back and keep on going back, but it's like it's forbidden. It's like now I'm in forbidden territory, and this is dangerous, you know? Well, that's what we do with these topics. We kind of push them off there, and we just don't go there. We just don't talk about them because we're afraid that it might get awkward. You've been in some of those awkward conversations? They happen a lot of time during the holidays. They happen other times, but you just can't avoid them during the holidays. A few years ago, we were down with Terry's family, and her uh, younger sister was at the— I mean, this is, this is like Christmas Eve. We're all around the table, and she just starts talking, and she says that she was talking to her friends the other day. We had just had the twins— And she was talking to her friends the other day, and she told them that, yeah, my sister and her husband have four. And she had the audacity at the table to say that she had told her friends that she wasn't sure if we knew where babies come from. I looked at Terry, and I looked at her, and I thought to myself, you know, like, yeah, I've shared before, Terry and I had, we had fertility issues, and we are really, really clear about where babies come from. Now, she, I'm not so sure she is, but we really are. It was a really, really awkward moment. Terry's mom uh, tells a story, which is really funny. She, the first time that her and her husband went on a, a cruise ship, you know, those, you, at dinner time, you've got an assigned table, and you end up sitting with the same people every night. Well, first night they're at the table and she's talking to the lady next to her and she notices that she has a little bump and so she says hey is that a you found out it's gonna be a boy or a girl and the lady looked back at her what's she talking about now not only was that awkward night one but every night of this cruise they had to eat dinner together it just it just kept on getting worse Uh, a few weeks ago terry and i and charlie and heidi we went to this pastor's conference and I'm talking, these guys at this pastor's conference were just way too cool. You know, they had on skinny jeans and leather jackets, and all their hair was all perfect and spiky, you know. And uh, and so we're on the elevator going back to the room afterwards, and Terry and and Heidi are making fun of Charlie and I, like, because you guys just aren't cool enough to be at this thing and to do what you do. You're just not cool enough. I mean, you got to change things up. Y'all got to start dressing like these guys. And, of course, they were joking, I hope. But, uh, I mean, this church that we were at, the guy had a runway that came out from the front of the stage out into the crowd, and he would, like, walk out in the crowd. And we were talking about that, how we've got this pole right here. (laughs) And if we had a runway that had a pole on it, that would be problematic in so many ways. (laughs) We just decided that's not a a good call. So we're we're on the elevator, and the girls are making fun of us, and they're making fun of all these pastors that that are teaching and in um, this one, the elevator doors walk, open up, and one of those guys gets on the, the elevator. And t- I notice it, and Charlie notices it, but the girls don't notice it, and so they just keep on going. You know, they're talking about this one, and we're really afraid. Charlie's like, he's behind the guy, like, duh, 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 duh. and we're afraid they're going to talk about that guy. So he just beats him to the punch, and he says, but you know, the best dressed pastor in all the conference was Pastor Lane. And he, he jumped and looked around, and man, whew, he, just, he just saved us. 
You just say something really, really awkward. But if you want to get really awkward, if you haven't seen Meet the Parents, you probably need to just leave now and go watch that movie because the whole movie is this awkward thing where this this potential father-in-law and this guy that's dating his daughter, you know, there. And when they're at the table and he has to explain how he milked the cat, it, it doesn't get any better than that. So we're so afraid that it's going to be awkward that we just section off those topics. But let's be honest, those topics, those topics are the things that are closest to our heart. They're, they're the things that we, that we care about the most, you know, the things, that, the things that we're most passionate about. Think about it, religion and politics. I thought about some other ones, money, uh, the struggles and sins that we deal with, our vision and passion for our life, you know, our real deep down, like what we want to accomplish with our days and what we believe God has led us to. Those are, those are heart topics that are beneath the surface. And so if we're going to know one another well, we're going to have to, open that up and speak in our heart language and just risk the awkwardness. But that's hard. You know, talking about heart language, that may not be something that you're familiar with, but if you've had friends that English is their second language, you've probably had this happen where they operate fine in English and so you're talking and and everything's fine and you think that you're close to them, but then you're with them when they're with somebody who speaks their heart language, their mother tongue, and all of a sudden they start to talk and connect on a level that you haven't seen that person in. This happens to me. You know, India is the place that I love. And Indians, for the most part, most educated Indians speak English pretty well. So I I speak on English, and then I'm with them, with somebody else who's a native Hindi speaker. And, man, when they start to go at it, I'm like, dude, they know one another, and I feel like I'm an outsider because I... I don't, I'm not speaking that heart language. Even though I understand a lot of it, I can't speak it at that level. And it's something beautiful. These things are our heart language, and we just have to, to move into that intimacy, even though it's awkward. And in Genesis chapter, chapter 2, you know, before the fall, you have Adam and Eve, and they're in this incredible relationship with one another and with, with God. And, and then, you know, it says that they were naked, 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 na- naked. They were naked. Okay, go, just go ahead and prepare yourself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about nakedness. Naked, nakedness. Uh, it says that they were naked and unashamed. And then in chapter 3, verse 7, it says this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they... They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And so what's amazing about this is this is, you know, God has said, don't don't take from the fruit of this tree. And they made the decision to break trust with God. And before God even comes back and talks about the penalties of that decision, this is an immediate thing that happens. They disobey God. They break trust with God. And immediately they realize their nakedness. They realize their vulnerability, and they, and they immediately make steps to try to cover it. Now, I've thought a lot about why this is, and I really think it has a lot to do with this. I think that, you know, there was this trust level between Adam and Eve and God, and there was this agreement that had been made. But then when it's broken from the perspective of Adam or vice versa, you know, she, that trust that she had with God and that agreement that she had, she just broke that trust. She just did that. So if, I, if she can't be trusted by God, then how can she be trusted by me? And at the same time, I broke trust with God. So now I feel the guilt of my, of my uh, lack of ability to, to be trusted. And so I'm guilty. So I'm shamed, and I'm afraid that she's going to shame me. And she feels the same way. And so now, now, now we, can't, we can no longer be transparent with one another. Now we, we need to be covered. Immediately, one of the results of the fall was that now we, we can't share that intimacy. You know, talking about nakedness, since we're, since we're there. The, uh, I don't know if you've ever stumbled on, like you've been at the beach, and you stumble over that little hill where there was a nude section, and it just feels really weird, and like you run back over the hill. Or if you've been flipping through the channels, and, you know, there's a, uh, one of these reality shows where people are running around the woods. I don't know what that's all about, but it's like, man, you're trying to get out that, off that channel as quickly as you can. 
Uh, there's just, that's a place that we just don't go, you know. Uh, in high school, I, uh, it was a small high school, and so we didn't have community showers. So you would work out and do whatever, and then you would run home as quick as you could, you know, and you would just take your clothes home and change at home. And when I got to college, I remember the first day, me and the other freshman guys from similar type situations, we're, we're sitting there in the locker room, and we hadn't really planned on this, that, oh, yeah, there's community showers here, and we're like, All right, this is, we're, fixing, we're fixing to do this. All right. And you're talking, about, you're talking about being awkward. But one of the things I realized through that experience over the next four years is that, you know, the old saying, yeah, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. You know, it's true the other way, too. They all take them off one leg at a time. And that everybody, when you get down to your birthday suits, you start finding out that we have a whole lot more in common. Humanity has a whole lot more in common. Now, bear with me. Like, you know... <laughs> We, we have all these elaborate coverings that we do. Now, I'm talking both literally and figuratively. All these elaborate coverings that we do to cover up who we really are. And the truth is, underneath the surface, we all have a lot more in common than what we realize. And if we ever get to that, then we actually begin to connect to one another. I, uh, I really experienced this related to, uh, to our marriage because I've told you before, Terry and I early on, we, we struggled bad. And it was this marriage conference that we went to, and, and uh, the speakers started to talk about these different things that couples struggle with. And at first, it was like, man, does he know who we are? Is he, ta- is he picking on us? And then we realized that everybody else was laughing, too, and specifically with this top- topic of sex. He, would start, he started talking about it. We'd never been in a room that somebody was talking about it. And we realized that other people were, were laughing, too, and that, that some of these things he was saying, like, we weren't the only ones. We weren't alone. A few years later, we went to another conference where the guy was teaching through Song of Solomon. I'm telling you what, man, now listen, it's the first time I'd really started walking through Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is steamy, right? And so, man, there's just like awkward things because he's just really going into what these different things mean. I mean, in there, it talks about how they're, they're, they're eating on these raisin cakes all the time. Uh, he, he explained that in the ancient world, these raisin cakes were this aphrodisiac, that, that, and it comes up all the way through Song of Solomon. And I'm, I'm talking, you're kind of like, whew. All right, and that guy, this was beautiful. That guy, Friday night, it was a Friday night, Saturday deal. He'd been talking about this all Friday night. It's supposed to go till 10, but he cuts it off at 945, and I've never seen couples leave a room so quick, man. <laughs> like, everybody fully understood what that teaching was encouraging us to go do, you know? And everybody acted on it. Uh, but you need times like that, that we realize, hey, we're all human, you know? And there are these things that we connect with and these topics that we've pushed to the side. I had a, a pastor that I used to serve under, and he was an older guy. And he and his wife, oh, man, it was just, it was just beautiful. Like, I, from, from the first day I met him, I could just tell that they, they still liked each other. I mean, they still liked each other. Like, I would be out to, we were around them where they were having dinner, and they, they talked to each other. And, you know, they would sit by each other real close and hold hands. and st- Like, they still liked each other. And I always try to figure out what was it, because there's some kind of secret here that this couple has. Well, I'll tell you what it was. One, of, one part of it is that they were honest about this. I mean, this pastor, this is so funny. We would sit in a room together with the other, other men, sometimes, you know, different leaders in the church, and he would teach on some things that we should do as men. This is who we should be as men. And every time he would teach on that thing, the way he would finish out would be, and if you do that, guys, your wife's going to want to have sex with you all the time. And I'm telling you what, we were very, very encouraged. We were very encouraged. But the saddest thing I've heard is when you talk to a, an older couple, and I've heard this before, uh, uh, a lady that is having a conversation with her friends, and she shares with her friends that for years her husband has been, you know, he, he thinks that she likes back rubs, and so he gives her back rubs. But she hates and despises back rubs, but she doesn't want to tell him that because she's afraid she'll hurt his feelings. So day after day and year after year, she endures back rubs, and he thinks that he's doing something that she enjoys, and she hates it with everything in her, but she, don't, she won't tell him. She'll go tell her friends. Would you agree that's sad? Because they're unwilling to have the conversation? Or how about with our children? I mean, are, are we really going to just let pop culture teach our kids about sex? Is that really what we're going to do? 
this incredible thing that God made. I've already talked about, you know, Song of Solomon. You got, you got Genesis. You just, I mean, God obviously talked about this and knew what he was doing, just like when our sister-in-law said, you guys don't know ba- where babies come from. I'm pretty sure God does. And he's not afraid to talk about it, and he wants us to talk about it. And yet, are we really going to let, we're going to not go there because that's forbidden, and so we're going to let somebody else teach the next generation what it is? Please tell me that's not true. But not just that, you know, one of those topics is religion. It's one of those forbidden topics that we just don't talk about. I think it's the reason that a lot of us, we never share our faith with anybody because we're too afraid that that will be an awkward conversation, an awkward conversation for them and maybe an awkward conversation for us. But let's think about this for a minute. This means that you have discovered that your only hope is Jesus. And that in him there is life and forgiveness and life eternal. And you have found this incredible thing. And you say that you care about this person. But day after day, week after week, year after year, you just decide that it's too awkward to have that conversation. And so you never tell them this thing that is so close to who you are. If they're going to know you, they have to know it. And it's good news that they desperately need to know, but because you're afraid of the awkwardness, you keep it to yourself. I I would argue, and you can argue with me if you want to, but I would argue that you don't really love that person. If this, if you really believe this, how could you keep it? How could you keep it quiet? We have to be willing to go there. Or, or your vision, your personal vision, and what your life is about. How can you say you really know somebody? How can you really get to know them unless you will, you're willing to care about what they see their life being about and what they're trying to do with all these different things that they're doing? What what are they hoping to achieve and where are they hoping to go? This was also something that was really awkward for, for Terry and I because early on. I really felt like we were supposed to, to live our life overseas. And I didn't really include her in that decision. I just made it and assumed, made the assumption that she would just be like, hey, yeah, let's do it. So I got the application from this organization that would send us overseas. I filled out the application. I signed it. I forged her name. And I was smart enough not to send it immediately. I, uh, I had a family Bible that they had given us when we got married, you know, a big honking Bible that was kind of out on the coffee table. And I assumed that she wouldn't have her quiet time in that Bible, you know. So I, pu- I put the application in there. Well, guess what? She decided to have her quiet time in that Bible. And she found this application that I had filled out, making the decision about our future and purpose without including her. Guys, so let me tell you, that's not a good decision. Our, our vision and our purpose is something that we have to be in agreement on. In fact, if you look up the top reasons why people get divorced, that's one of the top ones, that, they're, that couples are in disagreement on what their, their vision and purpose is, or they haven't had the conversation. So one keeps heading one way, and one keeps heading the other, and they just get further and further apart until one day they realize, hey, we're not even on the same page anymore. I'm going this way, and you're going that way, because they never had the discussion. They were too afraid to go there. So instead of having the discussion, we just decide to keep these topics in the dark. We just put them in that closet and shut the door, and we assume that as long as they're in the dark, that it's safe, that the dark room is a, is a safe place for those topics. Does anybody know that a dark room is not a safe place? If, if you've ever had, uh, you know, whenever a storm comes through and the power gets knocked out and you've tried to walk across a, a dark room, if you're a daddy and you've ever stepped on a Lego, I mean, I don't know if there's anything more painful than stepping on a Lego. It's like they're made just where they just cut into your heel and go right into your soul, man. <laughs> Legos are dangerous, and dark rooms are dangerous. Dark rooms are not good places. You, you flip the light on so that you can see what's there, and you can avoid it and make good decisions. That's what John talks about in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. He says, this is the message that we have heard from him, talking about Jesus. And declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Isn't that interesting? 
And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. You see, it's crucial that we, we don't live lives in the darkness, that we don't have those places that we shield our, the people that we love, at least the people we love most, that we shield them from those things. But that we open up the door and we turn on the light and we're vulnerable to one another. This is how true fellowship happens. A few years ago, I heard this guy speaking. You know, from, from the time I was little, just like you, I, I've, I know my insecurities and I know my weaknesses. And so I've always tried to cover those things up and, and only show the best parts of me. You know, like I'm constantly on a job interview and I only want you to see the, the best parts of me. And I don't want to be asked the question, what's your biggest weakness? Right? That's the hardest question to be asked in a job interview. No, I just want to tell you about all my strengths. I don't want you to see the places that I'm broken. And I went to this place, and this, this one uh, time I heard this teacher, and he was an older guy, big old, big old guy. And as he was talking, he was talking about the power of the message and that we make too much attention to the messenger. And he took his jacket coat, and he, and he, and he pulled it back. And I'm, I'm talking, this was a large dude. And, you know, it, there, it was, there it was in all of its glory. And he literally, he pulled it back. He was an old country boy. And he said, do you see anything attractive here? And no, we we all agree. No, you made your point. And I just bulked it back up. But, you know, I didn't talk to that guy after that. But I felt like I knew him. Because he had been willing to show something that was for him, something that that you would be led to hide and to keep quiet. And I could connect with that because I have those things, you know. From the, uh, from the time I can remember, I have a, uh, a sweat issue. So the way that it surfaces, for some reason, I, I, the only place I sweat is underneath my arms. And it's, it's pretty bad, especially at a time like this when I'm in front of a lot of people. And, man, I'll just start to, man, it's like a shower, you know. And so growing up, you know, I would, I would always wear black shirts or dark shirts very seldom would wear a colored shirt because you would you would see the ring that would go all the way down to like my belt you know it's just just really 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 embarrassing I got made fun of a few times and so I learned how to cope with that and how to protect myself from it in fact today you'll notice this is a shirt that would show the sweat rings but about a year ago I found they make these undershirts now if anybody else got this problem I'm going to save you a lot of trouble they made these undershirts now that have extra padding in the underarm and so I'm saving you today, the awkwardness of my sweat rings, you know? Uh, when, when I started to just embrace, you know what? This is who I am. And if you're going to know me, you're going to have to know that this is who I am. I'm not going to try to be somebody else. I'm just going to be this guy. And not, not long after I heard this guy show off his belly, I, I, I was in front of a group and I, and I said that. And I walked out that day and I don't know if it made any difference then, but it made a huge difference to me. Because now all of a sudden I felt like I could be myself and I didn't have to be and pretend to be somebody else. And I think that's the reason that First John says that when we're like that and we confess our sins and our struggles and, our, and, our heart, and we speak in our heart language, what starts to happen is we have true fellowship with one another. And true fellowship with one another is impossible without that. Without you willing to be vulnerable with your spouse, with your family, with anybody in this church, in your small group that you would hope to be friends with, you're going to have to take the risk. Um, Terry got asked one time, not long after we'd been married, she got asked to sit on this panel in front of a bunch of college girls and with other wives, and they were going to ask questions about dating and relationships and marriage and and uh, she was reluctant because she doesn't really like being in front of groups very much. But she decided to do it. And, um, you know, so I went there. It was just a girls' party. But she uh, actually, other people kind of told me the story. Terry was at one end of this panel. And, and there were all these other girls. And, and so they started asking the questions. And uh, I'll just say, this is the reason I love my wife. But they started asking questions. And, and uh, one after another... They started telling the story about what relationships and dating and marriage are supposed to look like. And the story that they were painting was one where everything is perfect and everything is is easy. And um, they even kind of made it look like, you know, you you talk for this long and uh, then, then there are like these 
decision points where you turn the corner and you talk a little bit more. And the whole time, Terry's there getting more and more and more nervous because, because her story and our story looked ex- nothing like what they were describing, right? It was as messy as it could possibly be. And this looked so clean and neat and tidy. And so as it got closer to her, she says she, she had to make the decision. Am I going to shave the story and spin it to look like that? Or am I going to take the chance to just tell the truth? And, uh, and so she decided, I'm just going to tell the truth. And after the meeting ended, all of these girls came up to Terry. And they started telling her how, thank you so much. Because now we believe that redemption is possible. Now we believe that we're not alone. Now we see hope. Man, I'm thankful that she decided to be, to be transparent, even for that moment. And for us, if it's going to be possible that we know one another, this is what the church is supposed to look like. The church is not known for it. The church is known for, uh, for people that are trying to just wear a mask and are hypocrites. But that's not what Jesus intended the church to look like. The church is supposed to be a place where we come here and it's, It's a safe place where you can be who you are and we can love one another in that and we all get better together, right? That's the reason I met the Grove because I believe that this is a place where authenticity is possible. And so I challenge you right now, there's a conversation as I've been talking today that you know you need to have with somebody in this room or somebody outside of this room that you need to go and you need to be honest. You haven't been honest. You haven't been willing to go there and you need to go there maybe with your spouse Maybe with somebody that something happened way back in the past and you're still bitter about it and you haven't been willing to just talk about it. But every time you see them, that thing, that scar comes back up again and you continue to be bitter. This is the week. This is the day that you go and have that conversation. And I promise you on the other side of that, there's freedom and there's true fellowship. Let me pray for us. Father, I...